This past Wednesday, we finally got this year's State of the Union address. Now, honestly, it's just a speech, right? But a funny thing happened. This year's speech was definitely on point and not just because of what the president said. I watched it carefully and of course I have some thoughts. It's time for some Roasted Opinions. Quick background, folks. The shutdown fight in January delayed the speech as petty partisan politics got involved. The new speaker, Nancy Pelosi, really doesn't like Donald Trump and vice versa. Their personal animus naturally spread to arguing over the delivery of the State of the Union address. This wasn't the only thing that the shutdown affected simply because the president and the speaker weren't budging over funding border wall construction, of course. But in this case, I think that the delay to the State of the Union changed the character of the speech for the better. When President Trump addresses Congress, there are always a lot of members, from the Democrat Party especially, who refuse to budge from their seats. They would rather stay firmly seated, looking like they are waiting in line at the DMV instead of listening intently to what the President has to say. We even saw some members who were more intent in keeping up to date on social media than listening to the speech. While I admit that Trump is definitely long-winded during his speeches, so was Bill Clinton. As a matter of fact, the average length of a State of the Union speech is 53 minutes. The shortest on record was 28 minutes long. Thank you, Richard Nixon. I would remind Congress of this fact, and if my senators or representative were among those who found their Twitter feed more important than listening to the speech, I would remind them that they can lose my vote in upcoming elections quite easily by not paying attention. During the address to Congress, there were several points of note. He began by pointing out the economy is strong despite the volatility of the last year. The evidence for this was the state of unemployment and the decreasing roles of those on government assistance. Nearly 5 million Americans have been lifted off food stamps. The U.S. economy is growing almost twice as fast today as when I took office. Think about that. Instead of making it harder to qualify for government assistance, his policies have made it easier to find work. Businesses are expanding their payrolls. The principal evidence for this is three things. Unemployment is low, hovering between 3 and 4 percent. Wages are rising as competition for available labor is tightening and the labor force participation percentage is rising. More people are choosing to re-enter the workforce as more and better jobs are being created. And since January 2017, a net total of 4,879,000 new jobs have been created according to the seasonally adjusted tables published by the Bureau of Labor Statistics. Those numbers do not include January 2017, which I credit to President Obama. By comparison, however, the previous president managed to create 11,621,000 net jobs over eight years, which if current jobs growth numbers continue, Trump will surpass around June of 2021. The labor force participation rate, which plunged from 65.7% in January 2009 to 62.9% in January 2017, has recovered to 63.2%. The total size of the civilian employment 143,369,000 in January 2009 was 152,128,000 in January 2017 and is now 156,694,000, up about half as much in just two years as it grew in eight under the previous administration. Average weekly earnings of civilian workers in 1982 were $352.46 when Obama took office and grew only $13.77 in eight years. Under Trump, it's grown by $9.58 in two years. That did set up Trump doing some crowing, especially about the U.S. becoming a net energy exporter and the number one petroleum producer in the world. 
And we have unleashed a revolution in American energy. The United States is now the number one producer of oil and natural gas anywhere in the world. Thanks to the Permian Basin in Texas and other shale oil deposits, this is true. What's more, the shale oil being produced is what's known as light, sweet crude. Oil low in sulfur and other contaminants and high in lighter distillates like gasoline and propane. Fuel prices are going down worldwide, and the biggest technical problem with processing all of the shale oil is that the refineries are primarily geared for processing heavy sour crude from Venezuela and Saudi Arabia. There are some environmental concerns that have been raised about shale oil, and the commodities markets certainly haven't adjusted to all of the new supply. But reduced energy dependence is good for the nation. And to be honest, shale oil produces less pollution than heavy crude or tar sands overall. Having covered the good news, Trump went on the offensive, and it was a sight to behold. He asked for an end to partisan bickering and endless investigations. An economic miracle is taking place in the United States, and the only thing that can stop it are foolish wars, politics, or ridiculous partisan investigations. He made his case that the U.S. needed immigration reform along that border wall. Now, Republicans and Democrats must join forces again to confront an urgent national crisis. Congress has 10 days left to pass a bill that will fund our government. Now is the time for Congress to show the world that America is committed to ending illegal immigration and putting the ruthless coyotes, cartels, drug dealers, and human traffickers out of business. He appealed to the defense of women and girls, sparking an uproar on social media when the cameras showed that Andrea Ocasio-Cortez remained firmly seated and unsmiling. Really, Sandy? You won't even pretend to support the end of human trafficking? Do you think this is a good image for you? Here's a hint. Um, no. Just, no. He then turned to the large group of female senators and Congress members clad in white in remembrance of suffrage and pointed out that more women were elected to Congress and more women are in the workforce than ever before, prompting the only spontaneous celebration from the entire Congress. All Americans can be proud that we have more women in the workforce than ever before. Don't sit yet. You're going to like this. We also have more women serving in Congress than at any time before. Having finally gotten the unsmiling bunch to smile and cheer for once, he moved on to trade, infrastructure, and health care. He demanded an end to HIV in 10 years and asked for half a billion dollars to fight childhood cancer. Thank you very much, Grace. You are a great inspiration to everyone in this room. Thank you very much. Many childhood cancers have not seen new therapies in decades. My budget will ask Congress for $500 million over the next 10 years to fund this critical life-saving research. And then he really started in. Abortion. I am asking Congress to pass legislation to prohibit the late-term abortion of children who can feel pain in a mother's womb. Defense. Over the last two years, we have begun to fully rebuild the United States military with $700 billion last year and $716 billion this year. Treaty negotiations. We continue our historic push for peace on the Korean Peninsula. Our hostages have come home. Nuclear testing has stopped. 
And there has not been a missile launch in more than 15 months. Much work remains to be done, but my relationship with Kim Jong-un is a good one. Chairman Kim and I will meet again on February 27th and 28th in Vietnam. Socialism. That America will never be a socialist country. By the end of the speech, I had noticed a few things. Speaker Pelosi was doing an excellent job of looking petty and bored. She shuffled papers, made faces, shuffled papers again, shook her head. I don't know if it was deliberate or accidental on either Trump or Pelosi's parts, but she really looked ridiculous. Ocasio-Cortez kept the meme industry production levels up. Holy cow, Representative, you look like a spoiled child. I don't know who you thought that you were impressing, but I don't think that you managed it. Bernie gave a lot of people a laugh when Trump said that America will never be a socialist country. And then he dozed off towards the end of the speech. I don't blame him for the latter. When Trump gets going, he ignores time like a Baptist preacher at a tent revival. Overall, the speech went well, according to Snap Polling. About 76% of those watching approved of the speech, giving Trump an approval number bump up towards 50%. I believe that's due to his willingness to make conciliatory statements and offer potential deals to Congress, and also his willingness to castigate every member of Congress for needless delays, including the Republican Party. He also issued marching orders to members of his administration, and I laughed at some of the faces they made as he handed them stacks of work in his speech. Overall, I liked it. Trump is still long-winded, but we didn't see much of the Trump finger. He sounded presidential again, as he tends to do when addressing Congress. I wonder if he will still sound presidential next week, when the House under Pelosi's leadership refuses to strike a deal on the wall again. Now that's just my opinion. Comment below to share yours. If you like this video, check out my playlists and check out these channels I have subscribed for more great content. New videos are coming, so watch this space.